Let's open our Bibles to our text this morning, and we're uh, still on the Christmas theme. I trust you noticed that, and uh, so we'll open up to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 2, and beginning in verse uh, 21, uh, we'll begin reading. Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, was accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Let's pause for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, again we want to thank you for your love for us. We thank you that your love isn't just limited to us, it is given to the whole world. We thank you that whosoever believes on you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you for that uh, gift. We thank you that what we have here on earth is only temporal. And help us not to forget that those in Christ, those who have believed life on this earth, this is indeed the worst it gets. And no matter how good it is, help us to remember, uh, we only have something better to look forward to. So we pray that each day that we live, our hearts could be encouraged, could be comforted, in knowing that there is a future that you have secured. We want to commit our nation to you. And as we think of, of just so much uh, corruption and nonsense that goes on, uh, we just pray that in your grace, in the face of this, that you could preserve our liberties, and that as citizens, we would use those liberties responsibly to uh, promote uh, the grace of God. And so we uh, pray that that would be true of us. We want to think of our brothers and sisters around the world and in other churches in this nation and elsewhere that uh, uphold the grace of God. We just pray that your grace could be encouraging and that Christians uh, everywhere would take hope. We want to think of those uh, who are physically not uh, doing so well uh, this morning. We just commit each one to you and we just think of those who are, are uh, either have COVID or are afraid of COVID. Uh, we just pray that you would give them strength and just help uh, them to just see through this. And in the meantime, we just thank you for uh, the health you've allowed us to have. And we just pray that we could uh, just uh, press on and do the right thing as we uh, think of promoting uh, the Word of God. And so we commit this service to you this morning. We pray that in our hearts we could be uh, uh, encouraged and that this uh, time of season, the Christmas season, would remind us that you came 
to be our substitute, that you came to die in our place on the cross. And as we think of this being referred to as the first coming, we just want to thank you that it means that you will come again. So we pray that we would look forward to that day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again and welcome. And let's open our Bibles, if we would, to Luke chapter 2, our, our text this morning. And as we uh, uh, title the message here, the uh, uh, Jesus visits Jerusalem, before we uh, get into that, I would like to uh, just remind us of Joseph. And uh, a, a few Wednesday nights ago, or a couple Wednesday nights, we looked at uh, Joseph in some uh, detail. And uh, what I would uh, like to just mention about Joseph is this, is that in Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 18, and let's just keep your finger, well, you don't have to keep your finger in Luke, you can find that. Uh, uh, again, let's just look over at Matthew chapter 1, and just take a little peek at what Joseph was uh, doing. And as we think of the Christmas story, I'll just remind you that uh, while Joseph's name pops up, we really don't hear a lot from Joseph. We don't really hear what he says. Uh, we uh, uh, don't really uh, know, except for this little passage in uh, Matthew 1, what he was really thinking. And so I would just like to uh, bring out a couple of uh, things about Joseph. And uh, uh, in verse 18, Matthew really distinctly uh, describes what the birth of Jesus was like in one verse. Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus was like this. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And I would just like to remind you that while the angel came to Mary and told her this was going to happen, and then she conceived, uh, the history behind this is this, is that as soon as that happened, Mary takes off and visits her cousin Elizabeth uh, and stays with her for three months. Uh, Elizabeth was six months pre pregnant with John the Baptist, and when she was six months, Mary shows up and stays there for three months. Uh, where Joseph fit in, uh, they were not uh, the marriage, while they were legally engaged, and we've talked about that, that had carried some real legal weight, uh, they were not married yet. And so here Mary disappears for three months. Uh, maybe Joseph was wondering where Mary went, uh, you know, scratching his head. I, I don't know, but when she comes back three months later, she's obviously pregnant. Joseph was never told that she was going to be conceived. Uh, Joseph was literally, uh, what, what, what could you say? Uh, uh, he was uh, just slapped in the face uh, with this uh, reality that Mary was pregnant. And if you put yourself in Joseph's shoes, uh, what would you think? Uh, you would think, what obviously had, must have happened, that she was unfaithful. And as we stop and we consider uh, uh, this right here, there's two things that we are described of Joseph. In verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Now, we won't take the time to look it up, but if you want to look up in Deuteronomy chapter 24, in the first four verses, it says this, that adultery was a capital crime, punishable by death. 
And if you were engaged and you committed adultery, you too would be punished by death. This is very serious and very severe. Joseph uh, was a just man. He was a righteous man. He wanted to follow God's word. And yet, we also see that he loved Mary. And he didn't want to make a public spectacle of her. And as we stop and we think of, of this particular story, uh, you just have to imagine, and I think for some of you, that wouldn't be hard to do. Uh, imagine the consternation that Joseph is going through. I mean, this would be, I, I, I don't know how else to put it, uh, this would be enough to make a preacher swear, uh, if, if, if you get my drift. Um, this would be a very discouraging point. And wouldn't it have been nice if God would have told Joseph ahead of time what was going to happen? Uh, it would have really saved Joseph a lot of consternation. But God didn't do that. He let Joseph uh, struggle with this. And we don't know how long Joseph struggled with this. It could have been uh, minutes or hours or just a few days. I, I personally think it was probably a couple of days that uh, Joseph just, he could hardly sleep. And uh, he got so tired that he slept very hard and had a dream. And in that dream, the angel came, the angel of the Lord, uh, came and told Joseph what was happening. But it was not before Joseph had uh, went through this right here. And as we stop and we uh, uh, just think of what we can learn from that, uh, do you think that it's possible that God could allow things to come in our life where we have no explanation for it. That it just, uh, we go through a period of consternation that is uh, uh, very difficult, a situation that we just cannot explain. And why is it that God would do that to Joseph? And could it be that God is trying to teach Joseph to trust on him and him alone. It, it's interesting, when the angel did come to Joseph and explain to him what had happened, if we look at the whole story, what we find is this, is that Joseph and Mary were the only two that were told of this event. Uh, wouldn't it have been nice if God would have told the whole town of Nazareth? Wouldn't it have been nice if God would have told uh, other people who could testify and back uh, their story up. But he didn't. And uh, you ask yourself, well, what can that mean? What can that mean to us? And as we stop and we think of where Joseph and Mary was to get their comfort from, and it's very interesting about us as people, we take comfort in the comfort that other people can give us. Uh, we hear all kinds of things about support groups. And wouldn't it be nice if Joseph and Mary had a support group that the Holy Spirit had, had uh, enlightened and they could come and support Joseph and Mary? Wouldn't that seem like a very wonderful thing? But you know what? God sometimes doesn't want us to get our support from support groups. He wants us to get our support from him and him alone. And I think it's, it's important for us to um, take a look at, uh, at, at Joseph and just keep that thought. God wants us to be comforted. God wants us uh, to rely solely on him. He is uh, our support. He is our support group. Well, as we uh, move on, and, and I'll get on with uh, uh, the story now in Luke chapter 2. That's a little introduction. We just threw in a little 
bit of uh, a couple Wednesday nights ago and a little something about Joseph right here. And I, I hope you, you think about that. Uh, God's word is true, whether anyone else believes it or not. And I think our nation is moving in a direction where fewer and fewer people are actually going to give the word of God the ear it should have. Uh, and we are going to see a time coming when true Christians are going to be, what, blamed for the problems of the world. And are we ready for it? And I would suggest to you that there's a, a lot of Christians that are not, that are not ready. And uh, I don't know uh, how we'll all uh, uh, react when uh, uh, the hammer really falls like it has in other countries, uh, but I hope that we will stand strong and take our hope that we have in the Lord and let that sustain us, and let that be our support group. Well, as we uh, move in to the rest of Luke, and let's get back to Luke chapter 2, and, uh, uh, and pick it up in verse 21. Now, verses 21 through 52, Luke is the only one who records uh, this event. Uh, we've already noted that uh, uh, John, he talks about the birth of Jesus Christ in John chapter 1 as flesh that dwelt among us. And he really focused on the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, Matthew tells us the story of uh, Joseph here that we just read. He gives Jesus genealogy and he tells us about the wise men and, uh, and in that particular visit. He doesn't mention the shepherds, but Luke uh, gives us most of the Christmas story. And what's interesting about uh, verses 21 through 52 is that uh, it's the only place and it's the only thing we know about the childhood of Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, as he starts his ministry, he is 30 years old. Uh, the next thing we're introduced to is John the Baptist, who started his ministry at age 30. Uh, and what does that tell us? That tells us that um, what we know about Jesus' life, and, and as we think of Jesus in the temple at 12 years old, that roughly gives us, what, uh, 18 years of Jesus' life that we know absolutely nothing about. We don't know anything about his uh, teenage years, his early 20 years, uh, what he uh, went through. It just simply jumps, uh, and Luke is the only book that tells us this. It literally then jumps to the start of his ministry at age 30. And as we stop and we look at this particular section, uh, I'll just break it down into some highlights uh, the first uh, highlight is the circumcision of Jesus at eight days old. The next thing happens 40 days later, uh, where he is dedicated at the uh, temple and a sacrifice is brought. And then uh, during that time, uh, Simeon, which we read about this morning, and Anna uh, gives testimony to Jesus Christ, and then uh, in verses 41 through 52, we have the story where Jesus is at the temple at age 12. Uh, I, I might just say that uh, um, you, you, you might wonder, and I, I hate to jump ahead here, but I get excited about all this stuff. The, uh, uh, why did Jesus get lost? How could parents lose their son? And uh, when you stop and you think about this, age 12 is very important. Uh, if you were older than age 12, you traveled with the men. If you were younger than age 12, you traveled with the women and children. If you were 12, you could pick. And a 12-year-old could go with dad, 
or uh, with the men, and or a 12-year-old could go with mom. Now, how old was Jesus? He was 12. So what would mom assume? He was with dad. What would dad assume? He was with mom. And uh, uh, they traveled the whole day, assuming that their 12-year-old was with the other parent. There. We just simplified the problem, didn't we? Okay, we explained uh, the problem of how the parents, and uh, I can just see Joseph and Mary at the time, what would they say? Uh, where's Jesus? Well, I thought he was with you. Well, I thought he was with you. And, uh, oh, no. And, uh, uh, and then the panic started, and they uh, make their trip back to Jerusalem and hunt for him and find him in the temple. Well, we'll save that for a... Uh, another service. In the meantime, let's take a look and at verse 21. Jesus is circumcised at eight days uh, old. And as we stop and we uh, just ask the question, what is circumcision all about? What was the big deal uh, with that? Well, let's turn back to the book of Genesis and see where this uh, rite was, uh, uh, began. And in Genesis uh, chapter 17, we have Abraham being promised a son. He was actually already promised a son. And his wife came up with a plan, and Ishmael was born. Ishmael was born before Abraham was circumcised. Isaac was born after he was circumcised. And in Genesis chapter 17, what we read is this in verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old, uh, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou complete. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. I will establish my covenant be between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And it's interesting that God is repeating in some detail a promise that he already had made uh, Abraham. And I will give unto thee, verse 8, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep, between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. Notice it's a token of the covenant. It's a sign that God has made a promise to Abraham and his seed. Uh, Will that promise be fulfilled? You better believe it. God's promises are always fulfilled. But this is a token. And what it is, is it's a sign that the Jewish people believed God's covenant. And uh, uh, later on, in fact, in the uh, Old Testament, in uh, the book of Deuteronomy, we're told that God wants circumcised hearts. And in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul makes that very clear, that what sets us apart is what happens inside, not an external show. In fact, 
uh, what he tells us is this, is that not all Israel is Israel. Because it's by faith Abraham was justified before God. And Paul goes to lengths to say, uh, was Abraham justified before he was circumcised or after he was circumcised? The answer, before. It's by faith that we are, are uh, justified before God. But this was a sign that was given to the Jews, that every male... Um, and so he goes on in verse 12, and he that is eight days old, here's the uh, instructions now more specifically, shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or brought or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house and he that is uh, bought with thy money must needs be circumcised in my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And so as we take a look, uh, Exodus 12, 48 uh, makes this a condition for the Passover feast. The Passover was a pretty big deal. And uh, if you were an uncircumcised Gentile or an uncircumcised Jew, you couldn't partake in the Passover. Uh, Exodus 12, 48 makes that very uh, uh, clear. Leviticus tells us, and we can turn over to Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, chapter 12, gives us some more instructions uh, concerning this. Leviticus chapter 12. And in verse 3, And in the eighth day the flesh of his uh, foreskin shall be circumcised. Eighth day. That was uh, pretty important. And so we ask this question, why did Jesus need to be circumcised? And uh, and I raise that question because circumcision uh, and the bleeding and all that is involved in the purification process is a picture that sin needs to be cleansed. Jesus was not a sinner. Jesus did not have a sin nature. Jesus, uh, as we saw, did no sin thought no sin, didn't even have a propensity to sin. Uh, he was the impeccable Son of God. And as we stop and we ask this question, well, what, why is that? And the answer is, is he came to be our substitute. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, and let's uh, uh, keep your finger in, in Leviticus. We'll be uh, uh, making reference to that again. But in Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul has this to tell us. Galatians chapter 4, and uh, we'll pick it up in, in verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. And so as we stop and we think of the, the dispensation of law, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and it was nailed to the cross. Now, Jesus Christ hadn't died on the cross yet. In fact, we just noted that he's not even going to start his public ministry until he was age 30. But he was born under the law. He was born... Uh, a Jew. And if you stop and you want to make Jesus some other nationality, I want you to know the Bible knows nothing of that. Jesus Christ was born to the tribe of Judah, to the house of David. That makes him a Jew all the way through. The genealogies of Mary and of Joseph makes Jesus and proves that he was Jewish. And as we stop and we think of the king that's coming, 
the credentials that he has. Jesus Christ has the credential to be the king of the Jews. And that's going to happen someday. That, that shouldn't even be a discussion on what Jesus' nationality is. Uh, he is uh, not whatever you want him to be. You know, I think Jesus is white. I think Jesus is black. I think he's uh, cock or, uh, uh, oriental. Uh, uh, listen, Jesus Christ died for whites, blacks, yellows, browns, and orientals. And as we've mentioned before, and I couldn't help but think of the, uh, in the Christmas song, uh, the answer to racism is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stop and think. Think of you that are here this morning. Did you know that God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. But he didn't end there. He loved the person sitting next to you so much that he sent his son to die for them. Not only that, he loved the people that aren't here this morning. He loved them so much that he sent his son to die for them. He loved Europeans he loved Asians. He loved people from Africa. He loved all people so much that he sent his son to die for them. And when we grasp a hold of that, and we see people who are objects of God's love, even if they reject Jesus Christ, they're an object of God's love. Really? You mean God thought so much of that person that he sent his son to die for them. I'm going I'm to tell you something, people. All lives matter to God. And when we can grasp a hold of that particular fact, that's when racism is going to start to crumble as we value the life that God values. And uh, I, I know I, I've mentioned that before, but I'll, I'll tell you what, folks. You who are believers in Jesus Christ here this morning, not only uh, did God die for you, but God thought so much of you that he gave you a gift to help you function. And he said, that is so important. When we see each other, we should see each other as important people who fit into God's plan, who has welcomed us there. And it, it, it should change our, our outlook. It should change how we see each other in Christ. Uh, there's the answer, folks. You say, well, can't you get a little more complicated than that? No. No, I can't. God did all the work he did the complicated part, and he left it very simply for us. And uh, for God so loved the world, what more do we need to know? Do you believe God? Well, I believe that only applies to me and my, my people. Really? That isn't what it says, folks. That's not what it says. Well, let's, uh, let's take a look. Jesus was born under the law. Verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And that is a, a very, a, a term of familiarity. It's like saying, Daddy. Very close, and that's what we have. Therefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Jesus Christ was born under the law, and he uh, uh, never uh, violated the law at all. Let me, let me move on here. Events highlighting this. Uh, and then we move to the dedication 
and the sacrifice. So uh, as we stop and we think of that dedication and sacrifice, uh, in Luke chapter 2, I'll read it again. In Luke chapter 2, And when the days of her purification, verse 22, according to the law of Moses was, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And so after eight days, and this is explained to us uh, in, the, uh, in Leviticus, but as we stop and we look, I would just like to uh, take a look at, uh, at verse 23. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Now look across the page to verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son. Now in the Old Testament, being firstborn was a very... Uh, uh, very critical. And as we stop and we think about that, let's make our way back to the Old Testament. And this time, let's stop off at Exodus chapter 12, and uh, we'll get a little background of this uh, firstborn and how important uh, this is. So in Exodus chapter 12, uh, and we'll just pick it up in the middle of the uh, passage here, but Exodus 12 is the uh, story of where Jesus liberates the Jews from Egypt. The nine plagues have already taken place, and the tenth plague is about to happen. And the tenth uh, plague uh, was this. Uh, let's pick it up in verse uh, 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And so as we stop and we think of, of what the firstborn represents, they're sinners. And as a firstborn child, uh, you're born under sin, and you're kind of the representative of the rest of the family. Uh, what this indicates is this, is that sin is penetrated everywhere. And what does it take to get out from underneath this particular curse. And as we stop and we think of uh, the firstborn, did you know, according to this passage, every firstborn, even the animals, were under the penalty of death? Wow, that's uh, uh, pretty heavy stuff. And, uh, and every house was passed over or spared, but there was a condition for that. And the condition for that is, uh, what is illustrated is this. You took the animal, a lamb, and the instructions were given. In fact, the instructions were given before verse 12. We won't go through them all. But the lamb was to be killed and the blood was drained, and then the lamb was roasted. Not boiled, but it had to be roasted. And, but the blood was taken, and it was painted on the uh, doorpost. And the angel's very clear that when the death angel will come over, he is going to look for the blood on the house. And if he sees the blood, he will pass over that house, and the firstborn will be spared. If he doesn't see blood, then the firstborn will be killed. The nation of Israel, and I don't know if there were a few Jews who said, this is nuts. I'm not going to kill a lamb and paint blood all over the door. What can that do? And I'm sure most of the Gentiles thought, 
what are these people doing? Putting blood on their doors? Uh, what is with that? But apparently there were some Gentiles who said, I don't know, but if God told, if their God told them to do that, I'm going to do what their God tells them to do. And uh, apparently there was a multitude of Gentiles that applied the blood. Did you know that this passage says it's not just for Jews only? It's for anyone who applies the blood, I will pass over you. Most of the Jews applied the blood, and the death angel passed over them. And this feast, this Passover feast, was established as an annual event to remind the Jewish people of their redemption from slavery in Egypt and how he established them as a nation. And as we stop and we think of, well, what does this actually mean to us? What's illustrated through this? The offerer of the sacrifice is guilty of death. And you say, okay, so then what happens? What happens is this, is that the guilt and penalty is transferred from the offerer to the offering. And what we have is what we would call the doctrine or the teaching of substitutionary atonement. Listen, folks. Nobody in Egypt could stop the death angel on their own. The only way that the death angel would pass over them would be if they had a substitute. And when you took the substitute, and in that case it was a lamb, the substitute was killed in their place. Did you know that Jesus Christ is called our Passover? Jesus Christ is our substitute. As a sinner, we deserve death. What are you going to do about it? What is a just God to do with sinners? And the answer is, a just God has to punish sin. The wages of sin is death. The only way that we can get out from underneath this curse of sin is if we have an adequate substitute. And what is so interesting is that Jesus Christ was born the spotless Son of God. He became the perfect substitute. And Jesus Christ died in my place. He died in your place. And he is the offering that took the sin on himself. He took our sin on himself. And given that, we have um, the... Uh, as we turn back to Luke, and uh, let me, uh, 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 before we do, um, let's, let's stay in Exodus. And in uh, Exodus chapter 13, we read this in verses 1 and 2. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me, all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both man and of beast, it is mine. If we jump over to verse 12, we read, Thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the womb, and every firstling that cometh of a beast, which thou hast, the males shall be the Lord's. And so as we stop and we think of, well, what role did the beasts play? Uh, lambs play. The firstborn male lamb. Uh, they're to be sanctified for the Lord. They were the ones that were to become the sacrifices. 
But the firstborn people, males, were to be set apart and sanctified unto the Lord. And as we um, stop and we consider uh, all of the instructions that, uh, that go along with that, uh, what we have is, and let's get back to Luke and uh, our story will... Uh, uh, have to be brought to a conclusion here. We didn't get to Simeon this morning, but we'll, uh, we'll get there. Uh, he's a very interesting character. And uh, in verse 24, we're told this. Verse 22, And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And to offer, verse 24, a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. We have a little hint here of the fact that Joseph and Mary were not rich people. In the Old Testament, it tells us that we should bring a lamb for this very event. But if you couldn't afford it, you could bring something cheaper, two turtle doves or uh, two pigeons. And here they brought two turtle doves. Uh, odds are that you don't usually have turtle doves around the house, that you would buy these at the temple. And so they paid for turtle doves, but they were a lot cheaper than a lamb. And so they brought the turtle doves and sacrificed them. One was a sin offering, and the other uh, was uh, uh, the scapegoat, you might say. And, uh, uh, and this is what happened right there. And so, uh, questions about that? The time of purification for a male was different than a female. And I don't really understand the difference and why God made uh, the purification time if you had a girl longer than if you had a boy. I don't, I don't know exactly why Scripture does that, and I'm not sure anybody really does, but those are the rules. So when a baby boy was born, they were uh, declared unclean because of for seven days. In fact, in the Old Testament, it's told us that any discharge of blood, including the female cycle, made you um, unclean. And if you're unclean, you couldn't go to the temple, you couldn't participate, and it never clearly explains why, but probably the best explanation is this, that we are sinners and any discharge we have is sinful. And this is a picture of that. And it really does raise the question, well, Mary and Joseph, uh, or, uh, or not Joseph, but Jesus, he was not a sinner. So anything that came out of him couldn't be sin. And yet he goes through this time period. They were considered to be unclean, the mother. And after seven days, on the eighth day, circumcision took place. But the mother was then considered to be unclean for another 33 days. So 33 and 7 is 40 days. Uh, 40 days, this is when Jesus came. So in verse 21, he is eight days, uh, eight days old. In verse 22, Jesus is 40 days old. And they're brought to the temple to, as the firstborn, to offer him to the Lord. He is to be used of the Lord. And I'll just end with this with Simeon because it's, it's, very, it's, it's very telling. We, we read the verse in Simeon and he says, and behold, in verse 25, there is a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. We don't know anything about Simeon. Uh, he wasn't a scribe. 
He wasn't a Pharisee. He wasn't a prophet. He was just a man who was looking for the redemption of Israel. And this man apparently was getting up in years. And he had a promise that was made to him. And the promise was at the end of verse 26, he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah, who was the Redeemer for Israel. And as we just stop and we think of this man, Simeon, he was a nobody, yet he was given the promise. And he was given a promise that he wouldn't see death, and he looked forward to seeing Jesus. And when he saw Jesus, he, uh, um, he said this, in verse 29, Lord, now lettest thou servant depart in peace according to thy word. And it, it's interesting with uh, Simeon, uh, in verse 28, he took the baby up in his arms. And did you know that he doesn't say a word about what Jesus looked like? You know, we just had a little grandkid and, and a month before we had another one and and uh, boy, they kind of look like their sibling. And uh, what color eyes they have. And, and boy, they have dark hair. And, and uh, 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 boy, they, they, do they look like their mother? And you would think Simeon would have picked up this baby and said, boy, Mary, uh, he sure has your eyes. That's what you would say. Oh, come on, you've heard. Uh, People describe babies that way. Simeon never does. We don't have a clue what color Jesus' eyes are. We don't have a clue uh, if he had a lot of hair or he didn't or if he was a beautiful baby or not. Simeon never said that. Simeon looked at this baby and he says this, Now I'm ready to die. Now I'm ready to die Verse 30, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And Simeon describes Jesus, this 40-day-old baby, as salvation. That's the description that we have of Jesus. And I'll tell you what, what a wonderful description of Jesus could you think of a better description? Wouldn't you rather know Jesus as your Savior, or would you rather know Jesus as a dark-eyed, dark hair, and he, being Jewish, he probably did. He probably had olive-colored skin. I, I would hate to say he wasn't a cute little guy. Uh, he, he probably was. Uh, but you know what? It doesn't matter, does it? It just doesn't matter. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And unless you've seen Jesus Christ, you are not ready to die. And you know what? We're all going to die. If Jesus Christ doesn't return, it's appointed unto men once to die. We all have an appointment with death. And you know what? We all know that. We all know that. And you people that are in your 70s and 80s, you know most of your life is behind you. You know that. Are you ready for that day? You say, oh yeah, I've, I've prepaid my funeral and I've got all the plans made and all of that stuff. Well, you know what? You might have that part ready. But I'm going to tell you this. You are not truly ready to die until you've seen Jesus Christ for who he is. He died for you. He paid your penalty. And he offers to you eternal life. I'll tell you, that is the true Christmas story. Simeon, this elderly man who is not a big shot, we don't know hardly anything about him. 
But we know one thing. He was looking forward to seeing salvation. And I hope that we all are. Let's pause for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this morning. We thank you for this story. And we realize that there's so much uh, in this story that we can glean and learn from. Uh, we just pray that we would uh, be like Simeon and just understand that in Jesus Christ, we have salvation. In Jesus Christ, we are prepared to die physically. And we just thank you that you have taken the sting out of death and that we all have something to look forward to. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.